Hey. I used to make a lot of a lot of my videos on pain and stuff and I probably still will but uh, like to be honest um, to look at the world the, the way the world is right now and I mean I always believe in God and the stuff this my eyes have been open to the stuff that I wish I knew a long time ago but that's okay so I am a born-again Christian a true born-again Christian which means like I, you can't fall away from that again you just can't it's almost impossible because you know the truth you don't want to sin anymore you know what sin is you don't want to get into these lifestyles anymore and the main thing is is that this blessed hope this rapture is coming and so I want to be ready for it and it gives me hope because um, you know a lot of the time like I live alone I just a lot of the time um, I have so much pain I have pain all the time I have a lot of pain and um, and so this gives me hope and so so I've been studying the Bible now for for quite some time but I'm really getting into it now and I think it's the right time I think it's the right time for everyone who's watching this video um, I mean open your eyes look at what's happening in the world do you think it's gonna all of a sudden get better I don't believe so I'm not being a pessimist either and the reason the reason I'm saying that is because you, you have to go and you have to read the Bible and then you realize, holy cow, man, this is actually happening. The world is going the way it said it would. Like, almost to a T. Um, the, uh, I'm going to read you a passage in, in a bit here, but... Um, at the G20, that just, that just was... For the first time they had, or I believe it was the first time, that Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum spoke. What are they doing at the G20? So they're implemented now, and the world leaders are listening to them. So you better believe it's here. What's here? The Pope and all these religious leaders are literally forming a one world religion and now this, with the World Economic Forum, man, this is coming together. This is what I'm talking about. I'm going to leave a link at the end of this to Redacted. It's uh, not mainstream media, and they have reliable information. Listen to, listen to it, and you're going to hear what Klaus Schwab says at the G20. Um, these are the people who want you to eat insects, okay? Go to their website. Look at their website. They don't want you to eat meat. They don't want there to be any farms. They're paying people like they're buying up land, uh, so we can't do so we can't do anything with it. They're doing all this fertilizer stuff. Can't have fertilizer. Gases. It, like this is this is what's what it's building up to be. Just look at the farmers in uh, in the Netherlands. So I just want to say, you know, when you listen to things like tarot, um, astrology, all that type of stuff, stop doing it. Um, all these readings, whatever it is, these things are satanic. To God, they are satanic. They're not going to get you anywhere good. And you know what? When you hear about people, oh, people have predicted this or that. Um, and if you go to an, you know, um, like a tarot reading, if they tell you the future and they're and they're absolutely right a hundred percent, so what? So what? These demons, these fallen angels, okay? Demons and fallen angels, okay? Separate entities. They have the power 
to, to tell you the future or at least tell you some of the future. They can. Don't be tricked by these. This is the worst thing you can do. I was into tarot at a bad time in my life for about six months and I stopped very quickly. I want to talk about the host. You know the host that you get uh, when you go to like uh, Catholic or whatever mass? Um, this is what the ref like reformers think, just people believe in an infallible Bible. When the priest is up there doing his ritual, okay, I've gotten the host many times in my life. I'll never get it again because they say that every time they say those words, you know, this is the body of, you know, this is his blood. John MacArthur um, from Grace uh, to You Church says, and I believe it, that every time they do that host, that means that they're bringing Christ down from heaven again and sacrificing him again, all over again. And think of how many times they do that in a single day, millions. That means that you're re-sacrificing him. It's, that's, that theology is, is incorrect. The correct theology is that it says that Jesus paid for us once and for all. It, only, it was only once. And that's another reason why I walked away from like a Catholic upbringing. I don't dislike uh, Catholic people, and, and I sure hope, I hope to God they're saved. Um, 1.2 billion Catholics, man. Give me a second. That's what the Reformation was all about. I didn't know about all this stuff before I'd heard of it, but I didn't know why they were calling out all the all the stuff in the Catholic Church. So, what else was I gonna say? Yeah, I wanted to say this. Um, any people, you know, there's a lot of anti-Semitism as as is foretold to be in the last days. There's, there's a lot of anti-Semitism. There's a lot of people in in uh, um, the states right now that don't feel safe. Uh, Jews don't feel safe. They're, they're, you know, they don't feel safe. And what I have to say is, if you're one of those people that's anti-Semitic, I'm not with you. Um, you have to believe, like, not believe it's the truth. They are God's chosen people. And God didn't abandon them. It might seem so. It's because they didn't believe. And God, God abandoned them. He left them for 1,900 years, but they came back, as, as I read you in that other um, thing. And there are many, many who have turned to Christianity, which is good, but for the most part, they're going to, it says in the last days, God will pour his spirit out on everyone. So, so you have, you got to hope and pray for them. Um, many will be saved, but many will be lost in the seven year tribulation. So they won't be raptured because they don't believe, they don't see it. There's a veil over their eyes. God has put a veil over their eyes, some, but for the most part, he has put a veil over their eyes because they have not believed and and that's why they God turned over to the Gentiles to give us the truth. And that's about to end. The church age. So I want to read this from Hebrews. And this pertains to um, why the old covenant is old and why why we moved to the new covenant that's why that's what made me say that about the the jews don't hate on jews that's not a good thing all the stuff that led up to world war ii is happening right now 
like they're they're being persecuted. So Jesus like Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there st still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? Aaron was a high priest uh, with Moses. Um, for when the priesthood is changed, the law must also change. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it's clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is more, uh, even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. One who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the, of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it's weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed further sins once for all when he offered himself. This is New International Version, by the way. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son. Uh, who has been made perfect forever. Just give me a second again. It'll tell you why. That was Hebrews 7, and this is going to be Hebrews 8. the high priest of a new covenant. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is anointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern showing, shown to you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus had received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises the jews will recognize this eventually for if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant no place would have been sought 
for another, but God found, found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, uh, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they didn't remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, it has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. It, and you know what? People always ask, well, does that mean that, that we who believe in Jesus have to disregard the old one? By no means. The Ten Commandments are still a good template for us to go by they're still applicable you still should follow them but as far as sins being forgiven you know like Jesus has has done this once and for all um, let's see how much time I have I'll read this worship in the earthly tabernacle Hebrews 9 now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense in the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna. Manna, when they came out of Egypt and they rained down manna. They kept one of them and put it in a jar. Aaron's staff that had budded and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim, cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover. But we can't discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and that was only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins people had committed in, in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was uh, showing by this way, or sorry, this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, uh, external regulations applying until the time of the new order, the blood of Christ. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is made, not made with human hands. That's to say, is not a part of this creation. He didn't enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial unclean, sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from act, acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is a mediator of a new covenant. Those who are called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So you see what happened? Jesus came here, the only way, you know, all the stuff that happened with Adam and sinning and, 
and, and, and being being tricked by the devil, Eve. No one could ever atone for those sins. So that was the old covenant. They made no covenant. They made laws. They made, you know, the Ten Commandments. But it wasn't good enough. They had to give sacrifices from bulls and calves. The only atonement that could ever set this straight was by Jesus incarnate coming in the flesh to kill the flesh. He came and died for us. Think about that. Such a painful death with a, a whip. Think of that. A whip with nails and, and glass on the end of it. And when they would hit you in the back, you would, and they would pull it out, the flesh would come out with that. He came, and he never sinned once. Think about that. All the information about Jesus, there is not one indication that he sinned. And he even asked his apostles, have you seen me sin? In the case of a will, it's necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when someone has died and never takes effect while, while the one is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. Blood, you need blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled um, the scroll all over the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's why it's so amazing that Jesus came and did this for us. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ didn't enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once and for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once. Think about this, okay? Just as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment. There are no reincarnation. There's no such thing. That's why I said that about the tarot and stuff. Don't believe that. When you see things on TV, people can recall past lives, even if they're kind of correct. Even if they can look at people and be like, that was my wife uh, in 1924. And they can even have, these are demons, these are fallen angels that can give this information. That's why I say to you, don't be deceived about anything. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's it for today. Um, I've wanted to do some videos about... Uh, about pain. Actually, my next one was going to be one I've never talked about. It's actually um, the, the irritability and agitation of pain. I haven't talked about that. As I'm speaking to you right here right now, I'm very agitated. Maybe I'll do that soon, but uh, that's why I hold hope for stuff like this. Thanks for watching.